<laughs> All right, now uh, our next presenter is a guy who's got a whole lot of energy and he has a very unique uh, uh, message about selling and I know it'll hit home for a lot of you in the audience today. He grew up in a, in a really poor area of, of Chicago, really rough area. And he went on, despite all odds, to get a bachelor's and then a master's. And he built a 25-year uh, career in the, in the B2B sales space. So he was a president of global sales for a company and was responsible for seeing over a half a billion dollars in annual sales revenue. And today he trains salespeople around the world to basically go after big companies, long complex sales cycles, a lot of decision makers. Some of the companies that he's worked with, uh, Toyota, Verizon, Citrix, Ally Bank, and a ton more. So today he's gonna share with you his B2B strategy for building a sales force and really scaling out um, to be able to generate million dollars in revenue. So if you're an executive or a business owner or a manager or putting in charge, uh, or in charge of putting together kind of a go-to-market sales strategy, this guy is for you. But I want everybody to stand up as we welcome him. Stand up as we welcome him. Stand up, get up. All right, put it all together for Victor Antonio. Here we go. Oh, this is Victor Antonio with another sales and goods reduction. Coming at you live with my first sales rap. Sales all right, there we go. Check oh, it it's going to be different. I sell all right. Beast. I sell it That's beast. it. I sell it. All right, you guys ready to learn? Yeah. I'm not here to mess around. You ready to learn, yes or no? Yeah. Are you ready? I'm not saying I don't believe you, but I got to put you to the test. Here's a simple test. Free up your hands just for a minute. Just free your hands for a second. I want to see if you're mentally ready to accept the information I'm about to give you. With your right hand, give me the OK sign. Go ahead and do that real quick. Here's what I want you to do. Go down to your middle finger, ring finger, pinky finger. Work that sucker all the way back up. Did anybody have a problem with that? If you did, leave the room. You're done. All right. Left hand, put it up now. Left hand, same thing. All the way down to the pinky finger. All the way back up. Did anybody have a problem with that? Because if you did, what should you do? That's right. All right. Ten Xers. Do not fail me. True test. Here it comes. With your right hand, give me the OK sign. Come on. Cool people, too. Yeah, you with the suit. Put it up. There you go. Cool people, too. With your left hand. Listen carefully. Instructions are very important. Put your thumb on your pinky finger. Now listen carefully. Don't do anything until I count to three. At the count of three, just to see if you're ready, all you have to do all you have to do is go down with one and up with the other. Down with one, up with the other. Yo, you, didn't I just say wait till I count to three? I didn't count to three. Wait till I count to three, I wanna see it. One, two, three, go. Oh, oh. Just put your hands down. Grant, they ain't ready, but I'm gonna go anyway. All right, I'm gonna show you a lot of stuff that may seem awkward. By the way, studies have shown that if it's awkward, it was easy to do with one hand because you've always done it. But when I asked you to do something you haven't done, it was a little difficult, right? But studies have shown if you practice this for how many days, it becomes a what? A habit. What, some of the stuff I'm going to show you is just going to require a little bit of habit for me. Now let's get into this. Who's here? How many business owners do I have? Clap. Mm. Entrepreneurs. Yep. How many managers do I have? All right. How many salespeople do I have? Oh. By the way, I need you to be honest on this last category. Be honest. How many know-it-alls do I have? Clap. Yeah, I know there's a bunch of you in here. But by the way, even if you do it all, if I can show you how to scale your business, would that be cool? Yes or no? Yeah. Here's who I'm talking to. If you're a business manager, you're a business owner, and you want to scale your business, you want to 10x your business, I'm going to give you the blueprint, okay? We're going to dive into it. A little background for those of you who don't know me. Originally from Chicago, as Jared mentioned, we were poor, 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 poor. My family is originally from Puerto Rico. Anybody from Puerto Rico? Boricuas in the house. Thank you very much. So we were poor, 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 poor. We're talking food stamps, government cheese, powdered milk. Clap if you feel my pain. Oh, my people. All right. By the way, take the poverty test. Back in the day, you knew you were poor. If the knob broke off the television, what did you use? Pliers. My man. At this point, millennials are going, what knob, right? I get it. <laughs> By the way, you knew you were poor, that if your antenna broke off, what'd you use? 
Man, there's some poverty in this room. I love it. The hanger. By the way, if you were so poor you didn't have a hanger, what'd you use? Aluminum foil. There's some poverty in this. My man, he's like, that's me. I'm poor. So my mother said, go to school, get the education, get that J-O-B. So I went to school, got the education, got the J-O-B, got an engineering degree. Why do you think I got an engineering degree? Yell it out. Money. You think I'm that shallow? You think I would get a degree just for the money? Yeah, that's about it. <laughs> Look, if you're, not, if you're here and you're not profit motive oriented, you got a problem, leave the room, okay? So I got into business, I got it. Three years into my engineering degree, I'm working at a company. Guess what I realized? I don't like what I'm doing. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You put all that time and effort, and you're like, I don't like what I'm doing. But sure enough, I started searching. I did technical sales support. And then when I finally got into selling, oh, you ever know when you're in, on purpose, you're in line with what you should be doing? When I got into sales, for me, that was like the hyper pad, man. I love sales. I think sales is a noble profession. Why? Because if you can have the best idea, you can have the best product, you can have the best service, you can have the best vision, but if nobody sells it, it ain't going anywhere. We employ people. You ever think about this? When you look at a company, everybody's a cost center. Sales is the only profit center. Everybody else costs money. We what? Make money. We sell things. We help families because we keep people employed. You get the idea. I want you to understand that sales is a noble profession. You with me, yes or no? That's what I'm talking about. So I moved up the chain, became an account manager, became a regional sales manager, director, VP of sales, president of sales and marketing. But I remember the one moment that I really had to learn how to sell. And again, for you people who are in the B2B, if you're in the B2B, I'm gonna show you something that may help you scale your business. Because when I moved into selling, they gave me a territory. And I still remember the conversation with the president. He said, Victor, I'm putting you in charge of the territory. The territory has never made more than $14 million, Victor. He said, I've had 20 people to choose from, but I'm choosing who? You. And he said, whatever you do, whatever you do, do not sell less than $14 million. That was the mandate. Do not sell, Victor, less than $14 million. So I had to go to work. Now, what I had to do was begin to understand my market. So let's start with this. Step one. Step one is what? The 90-day assessment. What I did was, the first step I took in was actually analyzing the territory. I looked at my territory for 90 days. I traveled with salespeople, went with them on their meetings, basically watched their presentation. And what was I looking for? Were they meeting with decision makers? Yes or no? Were they positioning the value as opposed to selling price? Remember this one, okay? It's not about price, it's always about what? Value, and I'm gonna show you how to quantify value. And at the end of 90 days, I had to make a decision. I had good clay and bad clay. Who knows what I'm talking about already? You know that you have, if today, by the way, how many business managers here have salespeople working for them? Clap your hands, just one if you're here. When you study your salespeople for 90 days, it shouldn't even take that long. You can probably figure out who are the best salespeople within what? The first 30 minutes. But I spent 90 days with these salespeople and I had three categories. It was very simple. There was people who were exceptional. 20% of my salespeople were exceptional. These are people who are killing the number. Leave them alone. Then at the other extreme, I had 20% of the people who simply didn't know how to sell who were I call bad clay. What do I mean by bad clay? They simply didn't know how to sell. They couldn't take direction. They couldn't make the sale happen. What did I do with those? Fired them. That's right. Many of you know that you got salespeople on your team that you need to fire, and you rationalize why you should keep them on board. Worked with a company last month. Lady says to me, the CEO says, Victor, what do you think of my salespeople? I said, well, I would fire that one, that one, that one, and that one. You know what she said to me? I knew you would say that. I said, so you knew? She goes, yeah, I've been thinking about firing them. How long have you been thinking about firing them? She said, what, six months. How much money did she lose? How much time and money did she lose? Six months worth, but she also lost the opportunity cost, which is an additional six months. You gotta make the hard decisions. What I typically find out is 20% of salespeople are great, 20% are not that good, get rid of them, but right in the middle, there are people who are good clay that are on the bubble that all you need to do is train them. You need to train the salespeople. If they can take direction, boom. So immediately fired about a third of the sales force, started building the sales team. 
first thing you do is analyze what you got in front of you. Part number two, territory. One of the things that wasn't happening is that we had not basically segmented the market. And what I did is immediately I started marking the territory. And I split the region into this many territories, seven territories. Why was this important? Because here's what I found out. Salespeople were flying across regions trying to sell something instead of selling locally, which drove up my cost. It was also causing conflict with my sales team because people were going into their backyards to sell something they shouldn't have sold. Also, the customers were confused because two to three salespeople would actually visit them from the same company. If you're not marking your territory, if you don't give them a territory, they're confused. Remember, clarity breeds confidence. If they don't know what they need to do, they will not sell effectively. This is the whole thing about eating an elephant whole. You can't do it. So segment your market, mark your territory. Step number three, define your verticals. Listen carefully. And I know I'm going quickly, but let's chop. You have to define your verticals. If you want to scale your business, I don't care who you are, if you want to scale your business, you got to define your verticals. What do I mean by that? I want you to imagine that these are my territories. For some reason, my slides are off. I need that slide. By the way, can you fix that slide, Jared? There's nothing on the slide. There should be something on the slide. Hold on. Bear with me. My apologies. I swear it's on the slide. We'll wait. We'll wait. So up to this point, let me tell you the squirrel story. I wanted to share this with you. Now, listen carefully. I've been married for 28 years. Give it up. Four different women, add up the years, doesn't matter, right? That was a joke, that was a joke, right? All the women go like, not funny, not funny, right? Not funny, and my wife's from Minnesota. Anybody from Minnesota? Yeah, for sure, you betcha, right? She's from Minnesota. So we were living in Minnesota, and it was really interesting. I had a neighbor, his name was Harold. Harold loved to feed his birds, but Harold had a squirrel problem. Do you know what I mean? He had a squirrel problem. Who's from the Midwest just clap? You know what I'm talking about, right? Had a squirrel problem. Every time he put bird food in the feeders, the next day the squirrel would get it. One day I remember I saw Harold putting grease on the base of the tree, the trunk. And I'm looking at that, like, what are you doing? He was thinking what? If it's greasy, it won't, what? Be able to climb up, won't be able to get the food. But the very next day, what happened? Squirrel got the food. Then he thought to himself, maybe I should put those aluminum sheets Who's seen the aluminum sheets? Who knows what I'm talking about? Just clap. You've seen them, right? Thinking again, the sorrel could get up. Last but not least, he put like a funnel upside down with jagged edges. Apparently, it was getting very serious. But every day, the squirrel kept getting the food. Why? Why was the squirrel always going to win? You've got to understand. See, this is like my spirit animal, right? Grant likes the octopus. I like the squirrel, right? I like the squirrel because for 24-7, 365, what is that squirrel doing? Focused. And all it's saying is what? How do I get to food? And by the way, did it mark its territory? Yes or no? It is looking at that house, that property, that is mine. 24-7, 365, all that squirrel is thinking is what? Is how do I grab the food? I want you to start thinking like a squirrel. Focus on grabbing the business. Let me see if I go back to these slides, because I really need to show you these other slides. Am I still stuck? I'm still stuck, <laughs> but it's a cool squirrel. All right, all right, let me go back. Can I go back? Back, I gotta go back, guys, I gotta go back. And by the way, we did preview these, so they look good. Go back, all right, hold on a second. All right, where's the whiteboard? Ah, screw that, forget the slides. Here's what's gonna happen, right? All right, screw that. I'm working right now. Here's what I want you to do, if you had your territory is defined, and I hope you can see this. I'll try to draw big. Let's pretend for a moment that I had seven territories. You remember I wrote that out? Yes or no? Boom. Territory two, territory three, all the way to territory number one. Seven. So now I've segmented my market. So let's pretend now that I have to create verticals. I came from the telecommunications business, which means I segmented my vertical markets. What do I mean by that? Cable TV operators, boom, vertical market, right? I had telcos, telephone companies, right? Boom, vertical market. 
When I went to, let me see, internet service providers, another vertical, you get the idea of satellite providers. What do I have now? I have now gridded out my strategy to grow my business. Now, if I have my territories marked out, my verticals, now the real key is how much money are in these what? Segments. That's the question. So I'm walking you through a process here. How do you size your revenue? Slide work? No, Dude, nope, nope, they're not working. None of the slides are working. All right, screw the slides. <laughs> All right, we're gonna do this old school. You ready? So what happens is, as I vertical my markets, I have each of the markets. By the way, think about it this way. Let's pretend for a moment you're selling a software system, and it's a payroll software system. If you don't get telecommunications, you also get this example. And let's say that you could have different types of verticals. For example, if I'm selling software, then one of the things, and again, it's payroll software, maybe I want to go after healthcare providers. So maybe a vertical would be dentists. Yes? Maybe another one would be chiropractors. Is everybody with me on what I mean by verticals? All right, I think we're back. Bam, no, no, we're not back. All right, so then, what I did was, it's, no, 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 there should be numbers there. All right, but anyway, do you have the verticals? Bam, those are the verticals. And then what I need to do now is I need to size my revenue. So what I then did, we got numbers. So what I then do is I gridded everything out. What do I mean by that? I looked at each vertical market, looked at each segment, and say, what is the revenue potential in those markets? Now, for example, this is the old presentation. Every one of these is a large market. I want you to pay attention to that green box because there's a million dollars there, and there's a million dollars there for a reason, right? So let's say that I did this for my territory. Now, how would I do this? How many of you are familiar with Edgar, right? Security Exchange Commission filings, right? I can look at company personal finance reports. I can also look at a publicly traded company and look at their prospectus to see how they're growing and where they're going to invest their business, where they're going to allocate their money. I could also look at magazines, blogs, industry magazines, and I can figure out what is the size of our market. Now, I know what you're thinking. Some of you in here are saying, Victor, I get it, I understand, but I don't deal with publicly traded company. I'm business to business. How do I size my market if they're not publicly traded? Well, I'm going to give you a simple formula for sizing your market. Here's what I want you to write. Look at the number of opportunities in your market, multiplied by the win rate, and then the average deal size. So again, going back to my example, forget the telco piece right here. You want to sell to dentists. You want to sell to chiropractors. You want to sell to healthcare providers. How do you size the market? Let's pretend for a moment that there's 250 dentists here in Miami or in the Florida area, right? I would write down 250. If I believe that I can close 10% of those deals, guess what? I'm good. But what if my average deal size was $20,000? At this very moment, I can now size my market. I'll say that market is now worth $500,000. And what I would do, and you can't see it on the left, but it would be the different territories within Florida. Is everybody with me? And then what I would do is go across and size everything up. This is what I would do. Most companies don't understand how to go to market. What I'm giving you is a go to market strategy to scale your business. If you have the numbers, if you have the territories, if you have your vertical markets, if you know what the revenue potential is per vertical market, at this very moment, you now have to go to market. How do we get that money? How do we get that business? Then we now go to channels. And this is where it gets really interesting. You can go after multiple channels. One is direct sales. You can hire direct salespeople. That's what most people typically do. But if you want to scale your business, you can't hire too many salespeople right off the bat. So you have to learn to leverage some of the other channels that exist in the market. For example, use a distributor. Is that a possibility? Absolutely. Somebody who will resell your product, stock your product, and resell it into the market. Or you can use value-added resellers. What are value-added resellers? They're one step above a distributor. A value-added reseller, pretend for a moment that you, want it, that you sell speakers. You sell a speakers, just a plain old speaker. 
you don't want to go to the market just selling a speaker, but what if you found a value-added reseller who sold home theater systems? Get the idea, and what do they do? Combine different products to what? Sell it all as one big lump product. So you can find value-added resellers and use that as a channel. You can also use OEMs. OEMs is basically let you white label, put their name on the actual product, and they sell it through their channels. And again, you're leveraging their sales arm, not yours. Last but not least is obviously online. These are five different channels that you can utilize to scale your business without actually hiring somebody. Again, one of the things you have to consider is that each of these different verticals, these different uh, distribution channels, has a cost associated with it. By the way, this slide right here is very important. It may be a little difficult to understand. Let me walk you through it slowly. Look at the left-hand side. That's cost and control. Notice that your cost will increase and your control will increase as you move towards the right. For example, if you hired a direct sales force, you have more control, but your costs are also going to be what? Higher. And as you move down the channel slide, let's go to online, your costs are going to be smaller because they can buy it online, but now you don't have as much control when you, look, when you look at reaching out to your customers. So keep this in mind. So now, let's walk through it slowly. I've got my territories. I've got my verticals. Now I have to make a key decision. I know what revenues are in each box. How do I go to market? How do I get the business? And then you would do something like this. Anything that has a million dollars, you would scale it. Maybe you want to go with OEMs. By the way, for some reason, I get all, everything on these, but I'm not getting it on these, just FYI. So I got all this. On the left-hand side, we have territories. Across the top, we have the different verticals. And basically, what you're doing is actually positioning your map. This is what you're doing. This is how you scale your business. And by the way, when it's complete, it'll look something like this. Again, on the left-hand side, you'll have all your territories. Across the top, you'll have all your verticals. Now, one of the things that I do is that if I know there's a million dollars in one of those boxes, in the territory, in one of those verticals, if there's a million dollars potential revenue, I will hire a direct salesperson. Listen carefully, hire somebody direct. Everything else, sub it out to a channel. Because now you've created at least four to five revenue streams. You got four to five different channels. Everybody with me? Say yes. You're getting it? Cool. Now, if you have this all in place, if you have this all in place, you've got your territories defined, you've got your verticals defined, you know what the revenue potential is. Again, two ways to define it, right? You can go online, look at publicly traded information, begin to fill your boxes in to see what the revenue potential is. Or you can scale your business, figure out your own revenues by finding the number of opportunities in your area, multiply it by the win rate, multiply it by the actual deal size. You can size the region. Step number four is actually figure out how do you want to go to market. And I'm telling you, the strategy is fantastic. It works, but you have to plan it out. Too often we have salespeople trying to sell to different verticals. Let's go back to the squirrel. Think about the squirrel. The squirrel has a territory. In that territory, it has one vertical. The vertical is called that house with that bird food. Your goal is to put salespeople on the biggest items on your map. Now, let me make a switch here. Now you have the go-to-market strategy. You know what territories you want. You know what the revenue potential is. The question is, how do you go to market? How do you grab that business? Now, I want to share this with you because I want to make a shift. We've done the strategical part, but let's go look at tactical. And I'm talking B2B tactical. Several studies have come out. One big one by Circle Research basically says that it takes eight weeks on average to close a B2B sale. Eight weeks. It takes 6.8 people to actually sign off on the deal. Let's call it seven. So this is what's happening in the market. A B2B deal is more complicated than a B2C. Everybody understands that. The question is, why aren't customers buying? Why aren't you selling more? Here's what one study found. And I want you to pay attention. Of all the slides I'm going to show you, I think this one will have the most impact on you. When they looked at wins versus losses, when they looked at a cross-sectional study of different sales markets, whether it's pharmaceutical, telecommunications, insurance, doesn't matter. When they looked at a cross-sectional study, here's what they found. They found that on average, you will win 40% of your deals. Think about that. You will win 48% of your deals, which means you will lose what? 60%. On average, you will win 40% of your deals. You will lose 60% of your deals. Oh, but it gets better. 
See, most of us who are in B2B think one thing, that if we're losing 60%, what's your automatic reaction? What's your automatic reaction? Let's do more trade shows. Let's create new product. Let's double down on marketing. Let's do more sales training. Let's do more trade shows. Clap if you're with me so far. I just want to make sure we're on track. We're good, right? This is your automatic reaction. Here's the problem. When they looked at the 60%, when they looked at the 60%, here's what they found. That 20% is going to your competitors. Let me, let, let me pause that for you, because this is important. When they looked at the 60% of deals that you're losing, 20% are going to your competitor. What happens to the other 40? You guys can do math. What happens? No decision. Zero decision. Uh, I'll think about it. I'll get back to you. I need to get together with my committee. What happened? People say they need to think about it. Well, what's even more interesting, digging deeper into the numbers, when they pulled that 40% out and opened it up just a little more, here's what they found. Only 10% did not buy on price. This is important because 30% made a no decision. Imagine for a moment that you shift your focus from trying to take business away from your competitor at 20% and focus your attention on trying to get that no decision market. And why aren't they making a decision? Why can't your clients make a decision? Yell it out. Why? Value? Why can't your clients make a decision? Yell it out. No. Haven't been sold? No. Here's why your clients can't make a decision. Because your clients are asses. They're asses. Now, before you get mad at me, want to kick me out, let me explain what I mean. There's something called the Buradance Ass Paradox. And basically it says this, that if you put a donkey or an ass right here, and I realize at this moment that that did not sound right, but if you put an ass right here, a donkey, <laughs> and you put two stacks of hay, equal distance, equal height on either side, the ass, the donkey can't make a decision. Product A, product B can't make a decision, and it winds up what? Dying. The reason your clients can't make a buying decision is because you don't know how to differentiate value. Look, I've seen some of the sales pitches. You know how to qualify a value, but you don't know how to quantify value. What do I mean by that? You ever talk to a salesperson, you ask them a question? Well, how good is your product? Real good. And it's fast. How fast? Real fast, Victor. Man, it's much better. How much better? Oh, so much better. Is that selling yes or no? No, that's not selling. That's meh. Right? That's noise to the customer. And everybody does the same thing. Everybody just qualifies the product. Clients want to buy from you. And it's not about price. Let me say it again to make sure you register that note. It's not about price. Study after study shows that it's not about price. Everybody with me so far? So if it's not about price, what is it? I'll show you what it is. It's this. Unless we learn how to use this value trinity, which is very simple to use, you won't sell. You'll always struggle in selling. So do me a favor, simple exercise, because I don't want you to forget this. Put your hand in front of you like this. Just free up your right hand and just do this. Just go like this, just go like this, and then go like this, and then go like this, and then go like, uh, yeah. All right, here's what that means. You can talk to any CEO in the B2B business, any CEO. You walk into his office and they only care about three things. How can you help me increase my revenue, reduce my costs, and expand my market share. Rock on, right? Because if today you're selling a product, and by the way, you can sell the benefit features, you can sell the benefit, you can sell the advantage, you can sell the gain, but that's what everybody else is what? Doing. That's what everybody else is doing. But if you cannot tie your feature, your benefit, your gain, your advantage to increasing revenue, reducing costs, expanding market share, people simply what? Shut down. That's it, they simply shut down. And so the question is, you need to tie it. If not, how do you do that? How can you actually put down the value? That's what people are looking for. So let me take a step back, because I know I've gone through this quickly, but I really want you to understand, it's not what you sell, we all know it's what? How you sell. It's not what you sell, it's how you sell. 
one of the biggest problems I see is one, most people don't have a sales process. When you look at most companies, nine out of 10 simply don't have a sales process. Two, when they train their people, they train them how often? One time. It's like taking a shower once a year. Good enough, go do it, right? It's not enough. So if you look at the strategy, it works. Using this strategy, we grew the business from $14 million to $98 million in two and a half years. Those, that's money, that's real money to me, right? And I remember when I talked to Grant, we're doing the interview, I told him a story and it was a true story because one of the things I had to learn was, it was how to sell value. I had to learn how to sell value, but I was stuck on price. And the story I told him during our short interview was, when I went back to Minnesota, after my first 90 days, to visit the president of the division, $3 billion company, I was running this division, business unit, he said, Victor, what can I do to support you? He said, at first I said, I'm gonna fire some people, to which he said what? Go ahead, do what you have to do, I'm here to support you. But the follow-up question was, Victor, how can I support you, help you grow the business to make sure, to make sure that your business grows? Now you gotta imagine this, visualize if you will, the man is sitting behind a mahogany table, bay windows behind him, art on the wall that's probably too expensive and very ugly, right? He's sitting there and I'm talking to him and he says this to me, what can I do to support you? Without thinking about it, what comes out of my mouth? If you could just lower the price, I know I can hit that number. If you lower the price, I can hit that number. And I remember he just stared at me. Yeah, it was that uncomfortable. And he stared at me and then he said, let me ask you a question. Now, by the way, when your boss starts out a conversation with, let me ask you a question, are you in trouble or not? Yeah, you're in trouble, right? And he said, let me ask you a question, Victor. If the only way to grow the business is to lower the price, why don't I fire you and your sales team and just send everybody a brochure with a small discount? And he looked at me, follow up, do you still want to talk about price? Now, I'm from Chicago, I'm from the hood, I'm not afraid of people, I said, Look, I don't know who brought this price thing up, but I think we need to move on, right? Because that's all you can say at this point. It's like, it's not about price. It's not about price. It's about literally growing your market. So how do you 10X your business? Again, simple step, assess the mess. What I want you to start thinking about, look at your business today. And I know some of you are just starting out, some of you are mid-sized companies, and maybe some of you are really killing it. But how do you size your business? How do you 10X, as Grant would say, your business? Assess the mess, and then make the brutal decision to get rid of people you don't want. Remember, there's good clay and there's bad clay. Get rid of the bad clay. In business, we know there's something called opportunity cost. As I mentioned earlier, if I keep somebody on for six months knowing, knowing that they're not good, not only did I lose those six months, I also lost an additional six months of opportunity and growth that I could have added to my business. Many of you know that you need to fire some people, fire them, cut bait, but you rationalize. Well, Victor, I had one person say to me, because I work with small companies and big companies, one lady, CEO, said to me, well, Victor, it's hard to find salespeople. She says it's hard to find salespeople. First, I should have said, come to Grant Cardone's event, probably find some great salespeople here, but why is it hard to find salespeople? It's not, you didn't train them. You didn't train your salespeople. Assess the mess. Next, mark your territory. I know that sounds wrong, but there it is, right? Mark your territory. Really segment your market. market. Because again, clarity equals confidence. Confusion equals chaos. If you just tell your people, here's the territory, go sell throughout Florida, they're not gonna do it. They're not gonna be effective. They're not gonna be squirrel-like. Third. Define your verticals. You can't go after all the markets, but figure out what is your number. When you size your market, ask yourself, if it's over X number, in my case, over a million dollars, I'm gonna put a salesperson on that market, and they're gonna focus on that market, on that vertical, I'm gonna put a squirrel right there. The question is, how many squirrels do you hire? And then use OEM, distribution, value-added reseller to really grow your market. It's amazing what you can do when you start leveraging other channels. It's like borrowing other people's sales force and they pay for it. Next, size your revenue. Figure out how much money is in these territories. How much money is there? I can't tell you how often I sit with a CEO of a company and say, did you size your market? Did you break it up into territories? Do you know your verticals? And what do you think the response typically is? 
well, Victor, you know, it's like, uh, yeah, we think it's about, well, don't think, either you know or you don't know. And most people simply don't know because they don't take the time to size their market. Next, define your channels. Again, different distribution channels to go in the market. Last but not least, sell value, not prices. Everybody with me on this? Now, too often, how many of us have ever gotten up in the middle of the night with a great idea? Just clap, if that's you. You ever get up in the middle of the night with a great idea, and you say to yourself, man, this is the most awesome idea I've ever had in the world, right? Everybody says that. And what happens when you present that idea to somebody else? They kill it, am I right? Look, Grant will tell you, I'll tell you, are there, are there dream killers out there who'll kill your idea? And by the way, let me fast forward. And look, let me, I wanna put you in the picture because some of you right now are thinking of growing your business or scaling your business, right? And here's what happened. You have an idea. Tomorrow morning, somewhere at 3 o'clock in the morning, you have a great idea. You're like, oh, my God, this is a great idea. You ever have one of those ideas that you just start tossing and turning in bed? And what happens? Your spouse kicks you out of the bed because they're trying to sleep. So what do you do? You get up and say, damn, that's a great idea. Man, I really like this idea. I think this is going to be a big idea. And then what happens? Like at 4 o'clock in the morning, 5 o'clock in the morning, by 5 o'clock in the morning, you are convinced this is the best idea you've ever had. By 7 o'clock, you're a millionaire in your head and you are retired, kicking back on the beach. Clap if you've been there. Am I right? And then here's what happens. So you're so excited. You're so jacked up about this idea. You're like, oh my God, this is a great idea. And you're fired up. You can't wait to tell your spouse. You can't wait to tell your colleague. You can't wait to go to work and tell somebody. And you're like, oh my God, I can't wait. So what happens? Let's say your spouse comes out, right? And what do you do? You run over, could be a spouse, could be a colleague, an employee that you know, somebody, a friend. By the way, biggest dream killers, friends, right? You got a friend. And all of a sudden you run up to that friend and say, look, listen carefully. Last night I had this idea. It's the best idea I've ever had. And then all of a sudden you start explaining this idea. All right, we're going to do this. We're going to do this. We're going to do this. We're going to scale it this way. We're going to grow our business. And then you say, what do you think? And then your friend looks at you and says something like this. Uh, it sounds like a good idea. Well, that's not the response you were waiting for, because that's a killer idea. And then you say, no, 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 no. Then, you go, then you're like, no, no, you don't understand me. So you break out the PowerPoint, you break out the board, you start going through the whole thing, and, and you're like, can you now see it? And they say something like this. I mean, it, it sounds like a good idea. I mean, I just don't know. At this point, you go into Jerry Maguire mode, right? You break out the manifesto, you break out maps, you break out charts, you break out everything. And you say, can you now see the idea? Your friend says, I've never seen anybody do it that way, so, I mean, go ahead. Right? You ever hear that? They go, go ahead. And what do you do? You walk away saying to yourself, that was the dumbest idea I've ever had. I can't believe I even had that idea. I stayed up all night thinking about that idea. And the dream is tucked where? In your back pocket. Fast forward life, one year later, what happens? Somebody implemented your idea. And you're like, oh, that was my idea. That was my idea. What was the difference between you and that other person? What was the difference between you and the other person? Took action? No. Here's your problem. You listen to stupid people. That's your problem. That's your problem. You listen to broke people. People who have no money. Stupid people. Now there's several types of people, stupid people. Don't get mad at me. Never ask three levels of stupid people you should never ask advice of. Level number one, never ask people who don't know. Fair enough, yes or no? Never ask people who don't know. Level number two, never ask people who don't know and know they don't know, right? Level number three, the stupidest one of all, never ask people who don't know, know they don't know, but pretend to know what they don't know. Because that's what you do. You ask the wrong people. So again, it's all about what? Pushing your dream forward. Use these strategies to build your business. Everybody with me, yes or no? All right, excellent, because I want you to be aggressive about this. Now, real quick, do you want to copy this presentation? The, the, the full version, by the way, the full version. Write down that link. That's, what you're, that's where you're gonna put it up there. You'll be able to download it, okay? So just write that down, you'll be able to download it. Now, also, I always get the questions, do I have sales training programs? These are geared B2B. And 
value-centric selling, intro to sales channel, business metrics are some of the things I covered in this one. That's the website. The same link will take you to that. And by the way, I have a training program, only 12 people, and that's as much selling as I want to do. If you're interested, go to that same link. All the information is there. But what I want to do is that I want to make sure that your mind is ready for success. Are you ready for success? Yes or no? All right. I need everybody to get on their feet. We're about to take, Grant, this is for you, brother, the 10X pledge. All right, are you ready for the 10X pledge? Yes or no? Yes. All right, listen carefully. Do what I do, say what I say. Put your fingers up in the air like this. Repeat after me. I pledge allegiance, I pledge allegiance. to my thang. All right, some of you look confused. So let me help you out a little bit. Put your fingers down for a second. Don't sit down. Let me explain something. It's my bad. See, there's a fundamental difference between a thing and a thing. Let me explain it. In life, when you do something you don't like, you just do it because you have to do it because it's about money. You got to pay the bills. You don't like it and you still do it. You'll always have a job. And we all know what J-O-B stands for. It stands for just over broke because that's what you'll always be when you do a thing. Now, when you're on purpose and you love what you're doing, we call that a what? When you're doing your thing, beautiful things begin to happen. It's like the law of attraction kicks in. You know what I mean? It's almost like you're in line with the universe. Everything works. And when you do your thing, everybody gets an automatic MBA, which stands for what? Mega bank account money. Are you with me? So we don't want to do a thing. We want to do a what? Beautiful. Fingers back up in the air. One more time. I pledge allegiance to my thing. Man, look at your thing. Let it know you care. To my thing. I will rise above doing what I love. I will make that dough. Look how happy you got. One more time. I will make that dough doing what I know. And those who laugh, say it like you mean it. And those who laugh can kiss my no, no, assets. Can kiss my assets. You guys have been great. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Oh, this is Vic Grant Mono with another Sales and Goods Production. Coming at you live with my first sales rap. Sales and deal. Check it out. I sell in the East. Awesome job, man. Sign this for me. Sign that for me. I got a page full. Who got a page full? Okay, light, light, lighten this place up a little bit. So I got some questions for you, man. Really, really appreciate you doing this. Where were you before, here, before you came here? I just got back from Egypt. In Egypt? Egypt. Did you see King Tut? No, brother. Let, uh, me ask you, let me ask you an ancient question. Oh, man. That's a setup question. Go ahead. What is the difference between selling and closing? The difference between selling and closing. One gets you money, the other one doesn't. Yeah. Closing is the one that gets you the money. At the end of the day, it gets you the money. Anybody and, can sell. Yeah. And, can and, and Victor, do you see them as separate arts? Like, do you see them like different than the meal and the, 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 the thing that comes? What's the thing after Appetizer. the Appetizer. That's before the meal, man. That's right. My bad. Where are you from originally? No, man. It's after the meal. The appetizer comes first, man. It's dessert. It's dessert. dessert. So, so, I mean, is it different? Are they different skill sets? Are they different abilities? I think they're different skill sets. And... I mean, you know, I'll speak about B2B. Yeah. That's my home. Okay. And so you have to do a lot of selling just to get to the table. Do you know what I mean? I don't think you, it's almost yin and yang. You just, you, it's almost like pushing on a rope, man. Mm -hmm. You can't have one without the other. And I think a lot of people try to do hard closing, but I think you know this. I don't need to preach to you about sales because we can sit here and talk all day. Buyers are smarter today. Yeah. They're into the buying cycle. They know what they want. They have all this information. They have all this access. You go in there, you try to ABC them hard. It doesn't work, especially in the B2B market. I'm specifically in the B2B market. Right. But, but do you think people actually try to hard close early? Because I don't see any of that. I don't, I don't see it. In the B2B industry, I don't see so it. So how do we know it doesn't work if nobody tries it? That's correct. I can't argue with that Because I'll tell you, there's a thing that we teach, that logic. right? There's a thing that we do in my company. Like if you've ever seen any of my videos where, where I'm working the boiler room, you know, and, and we're selling, we're selling hundred thousand dollar products, $200,000 products. We're selling multi-million dollar contracts. Exactly. What he was describing here today. And, and, uh, I'll walk past one of my guys. Where's my sales guys. Are they here today? Sales team. 
So, so I'll, be, I'll look at the timer oh, that he'd been on a minute and 20 right. seconds, and I, I ask a question. Anybody know the question? Have you seen enough to make a decision? Yep. So I don't think that that's offensive, but I know nope. this. If they nope. keep selling, la, 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 oh, it does this, la, 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 it does nope. this, la, 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 la. I think one of, one of the things I like. Like, can you finish you know, me, please? You, you know your video? Yeah. The one that you closed on, on, on the phone. I think Jared was on there, mm -hmm. and then you. Yeah, I took the, it, right? I took the call over. Yeah. And so I think that's the real skill set. The real skill set is you reframe the whole conversation. You know what I mean? You reframe uh -huh. the whole conversation, and I think that's what I don't see a lot of salespeople do. Yeah. It's like they're they they sell with alligator arms. You've heard that phrase, right? No, some never have. Oh. Till right people, now. Yeah. Well, some people reach. It's like when you throw the bill on the table, everybody develops alligator arms. Nobody wants to grab the bill. In sales. You eating with the wrong people, dog. Yeah. Yeah, you I need to eat that. with some of my that, friends because they're like, hey, the I'm going to tell you, I hang out with people yep. that are like, they want to pay first. They want to pay for it. They, they want to be the guy that pays the bill. Yep. That's the friends you want. Right. Huh? Give an amen. Yep. Yep. You want, you want friends, John, that guy right there, you take, go to dinner with John Hamlin and I guarantee you, you will not be able to beat him except for maybe Bradley. Bradley, he, he's fast Bradley, at paying too. I hear you. I hear you. What happens is most salespeople don't want to reach for the deal. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they're like, what do you think? Yeah. And I always tell people, if you end your pitch with the what do you think, just get out of sales. You know so, what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about yeah. that 60% number. I like it. Okay. I never trust numbers that end with zero. Yeah. Ever. No, no. I mean, they're, they're rounded up, obviously. Okay. Yeah. So, so. <laughs> well, I mean, good salespeople round numbers. I mean, if yeah, you want yeah. more credibility, give them a funky number like 57.3. Yeah. Oh, my God, that's scientific. You know. So, <laughs> I was just trying to keep it simple. Man. I'm just I'm saying just for, for, stuff. For, for those I'm of just... you out there that are running a business, if your treasury department or your CFO or yeah. your sales guy says, I made 100 phone calls, he is lying yeah. to you. Okay? You, nobody makes 100. Right? right? You make just 97. One for, one for good measure on top of that. Yeah. So, yeah. that's an interesting my, qu my question was um, the 60%, right. 20% mm -hmm. buy from company? somebody else. Yeah. 40% don't buy, okay? And, right. and, and your question to the audience is, why didn't they right. did buy? And I was telling my wife, they're uncertain. Right. Your, your yes. term for that was they're... Asses. Right. But really, they're when you're right. uncertain, you are an ass. Yeah. And if your customers are uncertain. So and then you talk about the value thing. Yep. What does it mean to build value? How do I actually, like, let's say I'm selling ties, right? right? How, do I, how do the people here sit down and say... How do I figure out what value is? How do I say that? How do I add value? All right, let me add it from a B B2B yeah. side. When you look at a price curve, look, initially, simple example. Initially, people are concerned about price right at the beginning of the deal. They're concerned about price. As they move through the process and they got to invest half a million dollars on something, it's not about price. There's other concerns. Think of the iceberg. The top 10% the top you see. I'm concerned about price, maybe, you know, is this the right feature benefit? But in the background, the 90% underneath the water is, I got to put my name on this thing, right? If I install this software, for example, uh -huh. how does that op affect my operations? You know, now I have to retrain people. I can go on and on with a list of um, what I'm thinking, I'm thinking, and most people don't address that. They think it's all about feature, benefit, advantage, and uh -huh. price. I'm saying that most people are afraid, that part of the brain. Yeah, they're, un they're uncertain, right? They're uncertain. And they're afraid of what might happen because when we're, look, when you're going to you know there are things going to go wrong. The question is, if it does go wrong, how will that impact you? And if you, the salesperson, can't make me feel good about how you're going to handle that, that's the fear part always kicking in. I think they're uncertain, but I think what drives uncertainty is also fear. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I guess they can go hand in hand, but it's, well, it's fear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and you talked about the 6.8. Mm -hmm. That the average B2B sale takes, well, how long did you say? Almost seven people to actually sign off on the deal. Yeah, so Explain these it. are influencers, vice president, CEO, yep. right. maybe a sales manager, the implementer. So you're saying each one of these really require a different value add Absolutely. proposition. Absolutely. The, the chief operating officer is going to worry about the impact of operations and production. The chief technical officer is wor worried about whether I can implement it. Is it upgradable? Is it expandable? Can I do something with it, right? The, the CEO is worried about how will this expand my market share, right? Purchasing the economic buyer is worried about could I get it cheaper or can I get it somewhere else? Yeah. Four different buying reasons and motives. So, so how do they sit down? What's the exercise mm -hmm. that I sit down with a glass board or a black right. board or a white board? Is that cool board or yeah, what? That is a cool board, man. 
That's and the first time I used that type of board. Right. So it's, it's, it's all glass, baby. Yeah, it is, man. Okay. Now, I could have got a cheaper board. I love it, man. Look okay. at that. It's, it's awesome. Okay. I could have got a cheaper board. Especially the red rims. The red rims, right? Got some red rims. They're like, they're like 10X red rims, man. I just got tired of the ones that you were racing, and, and then one day it, it doesn't come off. You know? So I'm like, let's get a glass board. Nice, so how do, how do I sit down, whether my client's buying a $10 product right. or a $10 million product, start building the story for those 6.8 influencers? Let's say that, let's go with the six influencers, right? Well, let's go with easier. There's a management buyer, there's a user buyer, there's typically a technical buyer, then there's an economic buyer. Let's just say four buyers, right? By the way, the acronym MUTE helps me remember it. The management buyer is usually the executive. What is he worried about? Is this the right product? Is it going to help me capture more market share? So that's his why buy. But what is he afraid of? Maybe this isn't the right product. Maybe I should wait and leapfrog with a different technology. The user buyer is the person that's actually going to use whatever software equipment you're going to put in place, and they're going to give their opinion. The technical buyer, again, is thinking about the technical aspects, and then the economic buyer. If I put all those four in a grid and figure out why they would buy, but more importantly, Grant, I add why they wouldn't buy. Mm -hmm. What would hold them back from buying? And if I list all that out, now I gear back my presentation, I look at it, and then I address those. And I know we come from the same school of philosophy. We don't let them raise the objection. We tell them, look, you're going to experience some problems. We're going right, to raise right. the objection. Right, we control right. the conversation. So, right. You know, you, you understand what he's saying? Don't wait for them to bring up the objection. Especially raise if you know it. it's there. If you know the, look, if you look, if you do some, I talk to your other salespeople, people have been around in the business. You know what the objections are. But some salespeople, sissy salespeople, I go, I hope he doesn't bring it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they yeah. like, oh, and then they, you end the meeting, you didn't get the deal, and then you're thinking, well, maybe, you know, they won't bring it up. And they're going to bring it up. The problem is you're not going to be around to address the issue. Mm -hmm. And so there's this curve called the Ebbinghaus curve, which I think is very fascinating, that said within 24 hours, you will forget 75% of what I told you. So yeah. now think about this in a customer situation. You walk out of it, he says, I'll think about it. Within 24 hours, he's forgotten 75. Within 30 days, they forget like 90%. The 10% they're able to recall, 50% is that incorrect. What does that mean? He forgot he was going to think about it. Yeah, even that. Yeah. So they don't. They don't. How, how do I pick, how do, if maybe for some people out here today that, that are, how many of you are in sales? How do people find the right thing or industry to sell? How do they find it? How do, how do you I, pick? Like if you were brand new, you're going out there and you're going to sell a product. I mean, the, the pat answer is you find something you like, but I fell into accidentally. Yeah. I fell in love with telecommunications, and I like technology. I came from that side. And so I just like, you know, things that go blink. You know what I mean? I hate to say it, though. I love technology, so I'd rather play in that space. You know, if you like music, for example, I mean, you can sell a lot of equipment, a lot of software out there. So I would start with something you just enjoy. If you can't be a what, musician, what, what, sell what, the software. What, but what if that thing's dying? What, what if you're in a space where, because there, there's clearly some stuff that's dying. Yeah. You love it. The artist loves their art, but they never sell anything because they, they, they never offer the donkey yeah. two stacks of hay. Yeah. Well, tell me what you think of this approach. Yeah. Again, I'm asking from yeah, your, yeah. Your, your point of view. It'd be interesting. When people say, Victor, should I love what I sell? I always say no. And here's why. I said, you should like what you sell, but you should love what it does for your customer. Mm -hmm. No, I Do you love know what that. I mean? I love that. Because love that. you're not focused. See, when you say, I love my product, well, you're being egoistic. But if I'm selling a product or service, I'm selling the Grant Cardone sales training program. I like the program, but I love mm -hmm. what it does for my customer. That should jack you up. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. That should jack you up. What if it doesn't make them any money, though? Huh? Yeah. Yeah. What if it doesn't make them any money? Find something that makes you money. Yeah, right? yeah, exactly. I mean, <laughs> hey, give them a big hand, huh? Thank you, guys. Big hand. Thank you, guys. The thing. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, man. Thank you. Big hand.